السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام. بس تاب نستعير إن شاء الله. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. تقدس من تمجد بالعظمة والجلال وتنزه من تفرد بالقدم والكمال. عن مناسبة الأشباه والأمثال ومصادمة الحدوث والزوال مقدر الأرزاق والآجال ومدبر الكائنات في أزل الآزال عالم الغيب والشهادة الكبير المتعال نحمده على فضله المترادف المتوال ونشكره على ما عمنا من الإنعام والإفضال ونصلي على محمد الهادي إلى نور الإيمان من ظلمات الكفر والضلال وعلى آله وصحبه خير صحب وآل اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ومن يعش عن ذكر الرحمن نقيض له شيطانا فهو له قرين وإنهم ليصدونهم عن السبيل ويحسبون أنهم مهتدون حتى إذا جاءنا قال يا ليت بيني وبينك بعد المشرقين فبئس القرين أما بعد Respected brothers, respected sisters, if there are any attending Respected viewers and listeners Everyone joining us for this uh, very important talk, very important topic. Uh, first of all, once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you all. Um, we extend our gratitude and our thanks ultimate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is the one that's made you want to come and sit in this gathering of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one that put that want and that desire, that plan in your mind that I'm going to go to this addiction talk. If you didn't put that idea in your mind, you wouldn't have been here. And so therefore we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding us to this talk. We are thankful to uh, Al Falaq Da'wah Project for uh, arranging such an important topic, uh, important talk. And also to Collingwood Masjid for giving us this facility uh, for, for the coming hour or so for this talk. Fadazakumullahu jami'an khayran. May Allah accept from all of us. Taqabbalallahu minna jami'an. The topic of addiction is really, really important and it's really scary as well because when I was told or when I was asked if I could do a talk on addiction, I was thinking that's a hard one because it's such a big subject, number one. And number two, it's, there aren't many talks on addiction, proper ones out there. And so what I did while I was doing my research for this talk is I actually went on a hunt for talks on addiction to see what other mashayikh, what scholars, what professors, what people, especially in the Islamic circles, have spoken about uh, in terms of addiction, other in talks. And so uh, I went through, I could say I think more or less all of them, and took notes down. And so you will find a lot of what's been said there, here as well, but in, in the system or in the syllabus that we've put it down in. Alongside with that, I've also done my research um, uh, in terms of academic research, I've done, uh, I've read uh, a few books, I've read uh, uh, blogs, websites, um, and so I hope that inshallah this talk will be beneficial, not just from a perspective of fear Allah and you know if you do this kind of uh, sinful activity you'll go to Jahannam, but also to actually put down profound principles or things which first of all define what addiction is, thereafter to sort of highlight the effects of addiction and also a thorough and a tested and an effective plan of coming out of addictions for those who are suffering from addictions and addictions are generally you know similar in many ways uh, obviously there are specific addictions and if you were to list addictions there are so many things one could be addicted to uh, for example alcohol is a big thing drugs all forms of drugs you know you could just imagine heroin cocaine um, weed, the whole lot, uh, marijuana, uh, then smoking, we think smoking is just a small thing, but smoking, 
even shisha smoking could be an addiction, uh, compulsive eating, uh, an addiction to eating, eating of any type, eat addiction to meat, addiction to chocolate, addiction to various types of foods. Uh, and then there's another addiction, uh, for example, other type of addiction, which is the, in the opposite direction, addictions to anorexia or extremely overcautious about one's, uh, one's uh, figure and so starving oneself. So that's another type of addiction of not eating. Uh, and then we have addictions to sugar, to caffeine, to self-harm. Some people are addicted to harming themselves and they find uh, comfort or some sort of uh, contentment in harming themselves. And recently there were studies done about, um, uh, on the topic of self-harm and they found that there are huge, huge percentages of young girls who are harming themselves because of, uh, often because of emotional outbursts or an ability to express their emotions or to control them. There's addiction to pawns, tobacco, mobile phones. There's addictions to even sex, which is something supposed to be, it could be halal, but even that could become an addiction. Pornography, movies, social media, gambling, gaming, music, these are all various types of addictions. And recently, according to the World, World Health Organization, they've actually categorized gaming. They've come up with a new term called a gaming disorder. So gaming could become a disorder if it takes priority over all else without any uh, composed thought as to what's important and what's not. So if you are giving, spending all of your money and all of your time despite other more important things, then you could have the gaming disorder. And so addictions are many. But generally a definition of addic uh, addiction we can take from, uh, from a website www.mentalhealth.net mentalhelp.net uh, and so they've categorized addiction as a mental illness or mental condition. We'll come to that inshallah. So addiction is the repeated involvement with a substance or activity despite the substantial harm it now causes or may cause because that involvement was and may continue to be pleasurable and or valuable to that person. And so it's a repetition of an involvement in a substance or activity which is harmful. But a person has become so sort of, you know, dependent upon it or addicted to it, uh, they can't give it up despite knowing the harms of it. And so that's a, you know, one of the definitions of addiction uh, and there are others, uh, other definitions of addictions out, of addiction out there. Uh, and so now, I just wanted to sort of start off with um, reciting a few ayat from the Quran and sort of getting a perspective, first of all, from the uh, Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about, you know, the things that make a person distant from Allah or just some ayat that I think are relevant to this topic and I'll briefly translate as well obviously you can't do tafsir because these are all big tafsir for each ayat and so in Surah Al-Zukhruf as we recite in the beginning Allah says وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَنِ نُقَيُّضْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٍ that whomsoever and it's not just going to be ayat or hadith there's going to be inshallah I'll make reference to studies as well inshallah in a moment and so uh, wait for it whoever turns away from the remembrance of Ar-Rahman and the word Ar-Rahman is, is, is used here intentionally and I'll say in a moment why نُقَيِّضْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا Allah makes him friends or makes him in company with partners him, partners him up or that person up with a shaitan with an evil jinn فَهُوَ لَهُ قَارِينٌ and he becomes his companion so Allah is saying that if you turn away from Allah's remembrance, and He says Ar-Rahman because Ar-Rahman is that name of Allah which indicates all of the mercies of Allah. And so if despite the mercies of Allah, a person somehow manages or forces himself to turn away from the remembrance of those mercies, then as the first type of punishment or as the seed punishment, Allah sets for that person a partner jinn. A shaitan who becomes his companion and invites him, influences him, directs him, commands him to do evil deeds of all types until that person eventually becomes completely destroyed. This is scary. Why is it scary? Because if you for example now ask the question, if God is merciful, then why does he allow for people to be addicted to heroin? or all sorts of addictions and then commit suicide. If he's merciful, where's his mercy? How is that a mercy? This person became helpless. This young girl, for example, became, to, became addicted to this substance 
which she became addicted to under the influence of her friends and peers, how is it her fault that she committed suicide? That's a question you can ask. But the crime that we are overseeing or forgetting is that, you see, God, when Allah created you, me, and everything that's out there, everything magnificent and beautiful out there, and this huge, huge, you know, universe with all of its uh, uh, complexity and, you know, how profound it is, he didn't do this all for no reason. You know, Allah didn't, you know, he didn't make us for Abbas, he didn't make it for no reason. This, this amazing designer didn't design this universe for no reason. And so he explains the reason. He says that I've created you to worship me and to remember me and to at the very least thank me. At the very least, thank me for, for what I've shown to you, for what I've given you. And so the moment you have turned away from this responsibility of remembering this Lord, you are already stepping in dangerous grounds. You are already handing yourself over to a huge problem. So not remembering Allah is in fact the root of all of the problems. You might be thinking you're just going to give me a spiritual talk, but think about it logically. Not remembering Allah is what causes frustration is what causes people to resort to other forms of substances or activities to fill up that hollowness that gap that vacuum and so not remembering Allah not being connected to your origin you cannot deny philosophers have even mentioned this a person is not just composed of body and intellect there is the mind there is the body and there is the soul as a human being, if you are not nourishing yourself on all of these three levels, you would not be a complete person. A certain amount of time might go with you just not being able to, not being concerned about it. But ultimately, when you become a composed person, when you are thinking, you will feel gaps, you will feel emptinesses, you will feel boredom, you will feel loneliness, you will feel uh, a, a lack of belonging. And all of this came from where? from not being connected to your source, your origin, your home, your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah is saying, when you turn away from Allah, Allah makes it easy for you to do sins. So the, this answers a lot of questions. How is it easy for me to do sins? There's another principle here, another thing you need to think about. Sometimes, taking from this, sometimes I find myself, or you might find yourself, or somebody may find themselves, that I am repeatedly falling into a sin that I'm trying to get out of. While not realizing that me falling into this sin is the punishment. Someone thinks he's, he's a strong person by committing murder or by being a bully or by not going to Fajr. And he thinks by doing these things, he is showing how strong he is. But he is not realizing that these crimes are his punishment because these crimes are putting him further into the pit of Jahannam so this is the first ayah I wanted to share with you and these shayatin that Allah makes friends with these sinners those people who have turned away from the remembrance of Allah they block their paths they block them from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the guy wants to go to the masjid this is no he stops him and he convinces these people while they are doing their sins that they are muhtadun they are in the guidance some people are doing sins, and if you advise them, they will be like, bro, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm all right. I'm a good guy inside. Don't judge me. You see, so they think they're okay. Hatta idha ja'ana until time's up. They go to Allah, and Allah shows them what they've done, and they see the punishment, and they now they say, Ya layta bayni wa baynaka bu'da al mashriqayn fi al qareen. Oh, how I wish that between me and my desires and my shaitan and my wasawis, there was the distance of the two east or a very, very big distance so that I wouldn't have been influenced by you. What a bad companion. That's one section of Surah Al-Zukhruf. Another part, inshallah, we'll come to this in a moment. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah says very nicely, and this is shaitan literally confessing. So Allah is telling us how shaitan will confess. And this is important, why? Because a lot of us often listen to the wasawis of shaitan and we don't think about how much of a traitor, how much of a backstabber, a backstabber, how much of a, of, you know, a munafiq he is. 
how much of a per, how much of an how much of a, you can say in sort of you know not to be rude but you could how much of a waste man he is you know how bad he is in the sense of he will make you commit sins but when allah asks him he says waqala shaytan and shaytan will say when allah asks him what happened what did you do to these people lamma qudiya al amr everything's finished eh? he will say inna allah he will say to us so to the sinners he made me sin he invited me to sin inna allah wa'adakum wa'ad al haqq he will say to me allah promised you a true promise وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ And I promised you, but I betrayed you. فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ And guess what he says next? فَلَا تَلُؤْمُونِ Don't blame me, mate. It's your fault. وَلُؤْمُ أَنفُسَكُمْ Blame yourself. مَا أَنَا بِمُصْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُصْرِخِي You can't help me, I can't help you. This is shaitan. When you think with your entire life, a person's entire life is often wasted by listening to shaitan. And as a result, he goes and backstabs you. Whereas if that same person was to call out to Allah even once for guidance, Allah would have guided him and he would never ever, Allah would never betray a person. Allah would never leave him hanging when he needs him the most. Allah will be there for you when you need him. That's another ayah. Another ayah says in Surah Al-Ra'd, Those who believe and their hearts find contentment in the remembrance of Allah, verily in the or behold, in the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find peace. There are a few more, inshallah, we'll reference them as we come, inshallah. Um, moving on now, there are a few more ayat, like I said, and inshallah, perhaps we'll come to them. I don't want to take too much time on this, uh, in this uh, sort of the, the ayat section, there are a few more things. And so we've mentioned that if you look at it from a logical perspective, from a study perspective, if you look read books about addictions, if you read blogs about addictions, you find that often these things that become addictions start as fun activities. Something time pass. Most of the time smoking becomes an addiction because of peer pressure. It's just something in the playground, in the corner, you're just smoking, you're having a fag, he's giving it to you. And it's just normal, it's casual, it's fun, it's, it's hunky-dory, right? Same thing with, for example, alcohol. Obviously, alhamdulillah, as Muslims, we have very strict guidelines about this. But even then, there are young men, women out there who are publicly drinking. When I had to be like, recently, one uncle was telling me, uh, I work in the masjid in Darum, like they said, and one uncle was telling me that he found this young girl, about the age of 14. Young girl, Muslim girl of Bangladeshi origin. You could, you could tell she's from Bangladesh. And she's not wearing a scarf. This young girl came up to the uncle who was wearing a hat going to the masjid. She asked the uncle, uncle, do you have a light? I want to spark my fag. Imagine the level. Imagine what situation we are in. Recently, there was a story of a young girl who gave birth to a child. She's not married. So this, not, this, is, this is pretty bad, but it's not the worst of it. The baby was born and inside the baby, they found cocaine inside the baby. Meaning that girl who wasn't married, while she was carrying the baby in a pregnancy, she was taking cocaine. Do you see the level that people can stoop down to when they go out of control? And so, subhanAllah, these things start off quite hunky-dory, just a fan, just a couple of drinks. You know, just, just an over-18 film. It's nothing, it's just okay, you know, it's just, it's just an action film, action comedy. There's a couple of scenes, so, so what, it's okay, it's just that's how it is nowadays. You know, your response is, I'm not going to get affected by it. It's just a website, it's a social media website, it's a dating website. It doesn't matter, see, and so slowly, alright? Same thing with caffeine and all of these other things, okay? Movies, social media, social media, you know, is obviously an addiction, but not to the extent of some of the other things that we're speaking about now. Music, gambling, you know, gambling is like a normal thing. You start gambling, uh, people start gambling with their friends, you know, just, it's, it's a joke. You're like chilling somewhere in the corner of the road and then you just walk into Betfred or Ladbrokes or Broke Lads, the other way around. And you're just like, okay, let's see what happens. Let's test my luck. And Shaitan would be like, yo, yo, you can do this. So you're going to put five pounds in and it's going to be 10 pounds. Like, oh, I'm quite sick. And then you're going to find yourself in Aspas Casino in Westfield. And then sooner or later, you got a big job and you're investing a lot of money into gambling and you're bankrupt. 
So these things start off light. And where do they start from? A lack of activity, that vacuum, that emptiness, that lack of direction. We've got to first of all thank Allah that you were born into a Muslim community and a Muslim family. Because a lot of these things that non-Muslims have to face, who don't have a strong terbiya uh, syllabus, who don't have a strong sort of, for example, community, you know, things are uh, shameful. There was a long time ago. You know, even British culture was, you know, something where shame was quite a big deal. But now it's just who cares? But we, alhamdulillah, it's, it's going away slowly, but we still have that social pressure which keep things intact. Social pressure can be a bad thing sometimes, but sometimes social pressure and this sort of whole concept of uncle's going to see me, neighbor's going to see me, you know, and then you sort of young people are always arguing against themselves. So what, man? What are they going to do? It's all right, innit? This kind of mentality that they build, they build their own confidence, but these things help us to keep, to keep on the right track. And so these things start off lightly. They start off as a joke, just as shaitan does with all of his games. When Adam والسلام, was in Jannah, you know, he started off nice and hunky dory. They were just fine in Jannah. He comes and tells them, have, have an apple. Have an apple. What's wrong with that? What's going to happen? Just have an apple. What's the least nice? And Allah told you not to have it just because you know, it's all right. It's fine. You'll be okay. And do you know what? As a benefit, you'll become immortal as well. It's, it's like a nice, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains very nice in Surah Al-A'raf. How the conversation. He was very, very convincing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes him by saying, He says, you know, about this shaitan, this, uh, this rejected shaitan, that, لِيُرِيَهُمَا سَوْآتِهِمَا وَقَالَ مَا نَهَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمَا عَنْ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ مَلَكَيْنِ أو تكون من الخالدين. He convinced them very softly. And the whole purpose of it was to expose their nakedness. لِيُرِيَهُمَا سَوْآتِهِمَا Their privacy. This privacy and exposure of privacy is so, so comprehensive. Because if you look at the whole Islamic Sharia, it's a Sharia based on covering. So your Iman is covering your heart with a cover that protects it from shirk and other sorts of you know, misguidedness, intellectual problems, lack of identity. So the Iman itself is a form of covering. Then we find, for example, our Ibadat act as an immune system, a barrier, an antivirus from sins. Recite the Quran, pray Salah, it stops you, prevents you, protects you from falling into sin. So this Iman is a protection and a cover for us. We find our Ibadat are a protection and a cover for us. We find our marriages in our societies, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. You are a cover for each other. And then Allah says in that same surah, Surah Al-A'raf, Ya Bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum wa risha wa libasu taqwa thalika khayr. And so shaitan's intention and his original crime, the original sin was to expose people's privacy and to expose their innermost, you know, their aspects of decency and to sort of get rid of that. And so we see shaitan starts off with a very nice, easy approach, makes it look nice and how it's innocent, innocent fun. And that then what happens is slowly it fills that hollowness, that lack of activity. Young people fall into this when they're bored with their friends out there on the streets. The first antidote, the first cure for that is, is to be so busy, to be so involved, to be in such a syllabus, to be in such a companionship, to be in such a terbiyah, which doesn't give you an opportunity for this kind of stuff. Give me some time to myself. He needs some time to himself, by himself, in his room, with his doors locked. No, he doesn't. Maybe not at that moment. Maybe if you know exactly what's happening, yes. And so to know, for example, exactly who we're dealing with and where these problems start from. Starts from a vacuum. We've understood that, inshallah. Shaitan will make it appeasing, nice looking. Slowly, slowly, this becomes a resort. I've got a list here of 21st century suicides. Some of the most richest people and some of the most, you know, famous people. Who knows Robin Williams? You know him, right? Funny guy. He committed suicide. What did he, what, what, what happened to him? 
He was a comedian. He was making me laugh and you laugh. And he was sad within himself. So sad he had to kill himself. What happened? He had it all. He was famous. He, he was rich. You got that lady singer that passed away recently or committed suicide recently in London. And we hear stories time and again of individuals who were in their Jahiliya times. They were in all of these things, but they felt this sense of hollowness, this, this, this emptiness. And then they, when they found Iman, we hear the same story from various individuals. Even Imam, I think, Shuaib Webb, he speaks about this before he became Muslim. He was a, a DJ and stuff and he used to work in music concert halls and everything. And he used to feel hollowness. And then eventually one day he begged Allah, Allah, please guide me. And somehow Allah guided him. And he, of course, now he's a renowned, you know, uh, da'i and invited to, to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so we find that despite all of this, I've got another question. So that's the first question. It was supposed to be a question. Why do we find all of these huge celebrities committing suicide? So next question is the opposite. Why do we find Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a man who slept barely a few hours? A man about whom his Lord, his God, his Creator says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ You're about to kill yourself. Take it easy. You're doing too much. You're overworking yourself. Day and night. What, what are they eating? Al-Aswadan. Dates and water. For months on end. Sometimes, of course, they're having good meals, they're having meat, they're having the steaks as well. But by and large, their lives were extremely tough. So, so tough. You know, the amount of money that had to be invested into the society for it to become sustainable, for it to become secure from enemies, it was way above their cash flow, if you like. And so those who had money literally had to give up every single penny. And so their lives generally, especially at the beginning, and especially in the beginning of the Medinan era, it was extremely harsh. Sahabas were standing at night in prayer. They were in the state of, you know, warfare. They hardly had any family time. We have a huge amount of family times now. They hardly had any family time. They used to have to go to work. They would be with the Prophet some studying when they had any free time. And so if you look at their lifestyles, they were extremely harsh. And yet, you find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most smiling of people. Allahu Akbar. How does that happen? We find that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are some of the most successful individuals in, his, in history. Some of the most successful in all of their aspects of their lives. In their ibadah, in their knowledge, in their spending in the path of Allah, with their families, with their offspring. Umar radiallahu anhu, he was, he was who he was. But it wasn't just him that he was who he was. Look at Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, who his son became. It, Abbas radiallahu anhu was, was great. But look at Ibn Abbas. These were amazing. And so that's the question. That how is it that those people who were, despite being in such a, a harsh environment, how is it that they were content? If you add both those answers together, that despite having all of the world, not being happy, and not having anything in the world, but just having Allah, but still being happy, I think what's missing in the first equation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or that spirituality, or that sense of belonging, or that sense of God, or that sense of a greater power. And this is evident, not just because I'm saying it, read books on addiction. There is something called a 12-step uh, a success, a 12-step uh, procedure method of leaving addictions and i will read that to you in a moment or maybe i can read that to you now just to prove one of the points that i'm saying now in the 12 steps it's called uh it's from uh, the big book of alcohol alcoholics anonymous and for, addi for addicts out there there are all forms of addictions like i said and there are for example for alcohol uh, anonymous there are uh, uh, drugs anonymous and there are so many things these are people who are working together anonymously without exposing their identities right to help other people and so from the 12 steps which have been proven to work proven to work and have been tested time and again in fact the guy russell brand the very famous guy a very foul mouthed guy but he's so funny sometimes and he was doing some good work recently as well he made his modern version of this with a lot of f words in them but it is saying the same thing but the point being is it's successful that this method this step the procedure is successful he says or this procedure says, number one, we admitted that we are powerless over our condition 
and that our lives had become unmanageable. That's number one of the 12 steps. Number two, we came to believe that a greater power than ourselves could restore us to sanity. This is a proven 12-step procedure by various researchers and is being used regularly um, throughout various uh, recovery centers. Okay, We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. There is a need for, need for God now. There is a need for God, especially in this kind of uh, treatment. We admitted to God, number five, ourse to ourselves and to other human beings, our wrongs. Number six, ready to have God remove all of our, all of our defects. Number seven, we ask God to remove. Number 11, improve our conscious contact with God. And then number 12 was carry this message to others, meaning da'wah. And so we find that God is at the center of it all. Whether you, you look at it from an Islamic perspective or from a study perspective, you find that this lack of ruhaniya, this lack of connectivity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what results in this kind of, you know, boredom activities and then into addictions. Moving on now. Right. One of the common things amongst all of the addictions I've found is that they have, they are same in the sense of they are either a, they are either a sin or an exaggeration. They are a sin directly or an exaggeration of something that could be halal. Okay, an overdoing, an excessiveness. So sin, you can just imagine, alcohol is a sin, uh, drugs are a sin, and you done it and then you became addicted to it, so that's a sin. But halal things which became an addiction afterwards, there's also this thing called, you know, this addiction to overhelping or helping too much, whereby someone wants to help others just to make themselves feel good. And this becomes an addiction where they give up everything to help others just so that they can feel good about it. And so this is harming themselves to help others. Uh, this is also, we can understand this from the story of those three companions who came to the Prophet ﷺ and they asked him about ibadah and they thought this was too less. Okay, and they said, okay, I'm going to pray all night, one of them said. Another one said, I'm going to fast all the time. Another one said, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to get married. And so that was an exaggeration that was about, about to happen. But then Prophet ﷺ stopped them. So something halal, exaggerated, could turn into an addiction, could harm you severely. Okay, so how does it happen? We've understood from our brief discussion so far is that the origins of addictions generally from our holistic and comprehensive perspective or view on this is that it comes from a sense of distancing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disobedience and a lack of balance. Lack of balance meaning something was exa exaggerated. So distance from God is what creates that emptiness, that vacuum. And that vacuum then needs to be fi filled up, some sort of comfort needs to come in there. And this distance creation is the crime itself. Because this distance is called ghafla. And Allah says, وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ He says, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا He says, we have set for Jahannam Lord of jinn and insan, jinns and human beings, and their crimes are, or what the, the, the things that they have in common is, they have hearts with which they don't understand. They have eyes with which, with which they do not see. They have hearts, you're telling them something, but they don't understand. Listen to this part really, really carefully, because this is, this is a cause and effect thing. They have hearts they don't understand with, eyes they don't see with. They have ears they don't hear with, meaning the guidance doesn't go in, it doesn't affect them. Ulaika kal an'am, those are like animals, balhum adal, they are even more dis misguided than animals. And then he says, Ulaika humul ghafilun, those are the ghafil ones, the unaware ones, those who have allowed for them to, themselves to become, those who have allowed for themselves to become unaware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so quickly uh, sliding back now again. And that vacuum was filled up with all of these activities, okay? And so if you were to cut the problem at the root, it's to obviously connect with Allah, but then obviously now we're talking about addictions, it's become an addiction, how do I deal with it now? Okay, there are the 12 steps which I will read to you and I will explain to you inshallah. And there's also some Islamic perspectives on this. One of the steps or one of the procedures of escaping a, an urge for an addiction that you need to do right now, for example, someone is addicted to something and they wanted to do it right now. Something seems so pleasurable 
but they want to escape it right now. Ulama have explained a three-step procedure which is to escape an instant attack of an addiction urge. We'll understand that first and then we'll inshallah think about curing it completely and properly. This is taken from Surah to Yusuf Surah to Yusuf very famous, right? One of the funny things about Surah to Yusuf is that there were some deviant sects before, sects like you know deviant people from the Muslim Ummah they banned Surah Yusuf because they thought it's a romance story. And they said, no, this is not allowed anymore. This, is not, this can't be Quran. Anyways, so in Surah Yusuf, we find the story of Yusuf والسلام, being trapped in a room with Zulaikha, Imra'atul Aziz, the wife of the governor. Wife of the governor is important because if the governor is someone important, politically, you know, stable, rich, he's going to have someone who he likes, someone beautiful. And so Zulaikha was known to be beautiful. And so Yusuf والسلام, was obviously growing up in her household and she was in fact told to look after him really well. But then when he became a shudda, he, he reached his, uh, you know, he, he reached his age, age of maturity or he became himself basically. He became a man. He became extremely handsome. Really, really good looking guy. All the good, a good sort of, you know, features you can imagine. He had it all. And so Zulaikha, who was supposed to be his like, you know, supervisor, even like a mother, mother figure, she fell in love with him and what she did she did something really really crazy crime she trapped him in a room uh, locking so many doors in a palace because obviously governor's house so it's going to be a palace inside the palace there are so many doors and he eventually in that whole room locked all the doors and she said to him now now you're going to have to basically fulfill what i want you to do from this incident ulama explain and say that there are three things from this situation where we learn how to escape a sudden urge, a surge of, of, of shaitanic inspirations. Because وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا tells us, and of course there are so many tafsirs of this. Some even try to say that this hammat and hammat means like the pushing and shoving and he pushed away and she came forward. But ultimately the more al-ma'na al-aqrab, the most apparent meaning or the one that Mufassirun have generally gone with, is that Yusuf والسلام, also felt an urge because he's a human being and feeling an urge does it, is not a sin. Feeling uh, an emotion is not a sin. Once you have done an azim of that, and so hadith of, uh, of Muslim and of Arba'un and all of that, uh, where he says, you know, كان حريصا على قتل أخيه, that he was, uh, those two Muslims who were fighting with each other, even the killer goes to Jahannam, you might be thinking, why he didn't do anything? It's because he became determined to kill. And so determined is the sin, but if you just have a thought, it's not a sin yet. And so Hamad Bihi basically he also had some sort of an emotion. At that moment, despite having that emotion and this opportunity, first thing he says, or the three steps we take from here, from this incident, Qala Ma'adallah. I resort and seek refuge in Allah. The first thing to do, based on this incident, when you have a surge, an urge of fulfilling that addictive activity is you need to straight away fully resort to Allah. Fully resort to Allah. Not like, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah, I'm still looking at it. A'udhu Billah, I'm still taking the next path. A'udhu Billah, 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 A'udhu Ma'adha Allah, a'udhu billah, oh Allah, I only come to you for help, oh Allah, please help me. So first of all, sincerely seeking Allah's help. This is really important because when it is an emotional activity, someone is deeply inclined to this thing, this kind of superficial one, you know, overly saying, a'udhu billah, it's not going to do nothing, mate. It's not going to do nothing. You might be doing the activity and saying, astaghfirullah and a'udhu billah still. It has to be from deep within. So ma'adha Allah. And then the next step that you need to be, we need to be willing to make to be able to escape a sudden surge, which is addictive, right? Now let's wait for everyone calms down for a moment and then we'll carry on. Okay. So seek refuge in Allah. Secondly, you need to be willing to sacrifice. Determined to be willing to sacrifice. You need to be determined. قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّ أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَايَا إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّمَ And then he says afterwards, when he, when he starts to, when he is determined to leave the sin, he starts to run. 
He starts running, meaning he is willing to sacrifice. If you are not willing to sacrifice, and we'll talk about why it is important for you to sacrifice, if you're not willing to sacrifice, then you're not going to get anywhere. You have to be willing to give up something to leave this urge and surge. And the third step is to do everything in your capacity to run. So you cannot be going, driving towards the location of the pickup and saying A'udhu Billah at the same time. No, what you need to do is if the pickup is in Shadwell, you need to go into the A406 and go to Enfield. You need to run literally in the opposite direction. Ma'adhallah, willing to sacrifice, I don't care if I have to lose this amount of money. If I don't care if I have to lose this friend. I don't care if I have to lose this, this social, your circle respect. I don't care. I'm willing to sacrifice it. And then doing everything in your capacity because Yusuf what did he do? Despite him knowing the doors were locked, he ran. And so he done his part and Allah opened the doors. So you have to do everything in your capacity. So we've understood now, quick recap so far, where addictions come from. We've understood from an Islamic perspective that they come from a sense of hollowness, uh, hollowness or a lack of connection. This is filled up with this appeasing and appealing activity, whichever thing you may be addicted to afterwards. And thereafter, it becomes such a habit from which you cannot escape, even though now you know. From one of the lectures I've listened to, there was one young man who said he wanted to commit suicide because of his addiction. He used to do a certain sinful act in his, private, in his privacy. I will, I will not disclose exact words. Okay. For six hours a day. For three years. Eventually, he became so helpless and so hopeless, he wanted to commit suicide. This caused him to have a physical illness, some sort of a dysfunction, which basically destroyed his life for, forever. And so these are things that can happen to individuals. In an urge, in a moment of search, this is what you need to do. We are coming to how do we cure this now for a long term for it. I think I'm missing so much stuff, but I'm inshallah I have to paraphrase and so obviously this time is also a, a thing to uh, think about, inshallah. Um, right. First what I'll do is I'll read those according to um, the research and the and the book from this is a book called uh, called um, uh, there are no uh, there's no big deal by John Coates and there's a forward in it by a gentleman called Dr. Um, Robert Lefevre and he says this it's really interesting he says addiction is a disease of the human spirit sounds like a sheikh addiction is a disease of the human spirit it's a Rouhani issue yeah <laughs> it eats away at hope love trust honor innocence and all of the beautiful spiritual values that give life its significance let me read that again dr robert lefever the director of the promise recovery uh, center in kent he says addiction is a disease of the human spirit he's not even talking about the activity is it a problem of the human spirit it, it eats away at hope love trust honor innocence and all of the beautiful spiritual values that that give life its significance this is this is very very powerful and then in that same book they define an addictive disease the condition which underlies many addictive compulsive behaviors and an addictive disorder is one of the many different ways in which the addictive disease manifests itself a few more things i want to read from here as well okay he says here this is very interesting he says no noob, noble or no knowledgeable physician okay no knowledgeable doctor can give you an infallible cure to your addiction okay you can imagine this from like actually an islamic scholar right so he says no sheikh can cure your addiction no doctor can cure your problem your ruhani issue that's what he's saying ultimately the most that can be done is suggest to you ways in which you can treat your own condition okay Okay, moving on now. There's a few more things that I'm saying. And then in the one of the first few pages in the books, he said, there are some basics in order to leave addictions. First of all, it demands perseverance. Sounds a bit like the three points I've said to you from Surah Yusuf. It deserves, it demands perseverance, emo emotional and intellectual honesty. One of the things about addictions is the first step to curing yourself from it is to admit to to be honest with yourself and to realize that you've got this problem otherwise if you are convincing yourself hey, nah, it's, it's, i just do it sometimes i'm not really addicted it's just sometimes 
then you're, not, you're never going to deal with the problem. Whatever the problem is, you need to first of all see that it's a problem, admit to it, and that's the first step. So it demands perseverance, emotional and intellectual honesty and willingness. Okay? And then he says, for example, we shall, we shall have to become new and different people. We are meant to be these people, right? It's not an accomplishment to be overnight, this is a cure from addiction. He says, there will never be a time, there will never be a time, these are for ad addicted people, there, are, there is never a time, and this is, I'll put it into context, there will never, never be a time when you can say you are completely cured for your, from your addiction. There's never a time, okay? Freedom depends on active measures to prevent the addiction from recurring. Basically, in Rouhani terms, in Tezkiyah terms, you will never be able to say that I've become a muttaqi. Or I have become a person who is completely spiritually clean. The best you can do is to set up a list of activities, a, a set of measures, a protocol which will on a regular basis protect you from falling into that same ghafla again. Your adhkar, your salawat. Here, of course, there are a few things that will suggest them. I've been given a very short amount of time. Okay. Right, I said, so I said, the question that comes up often is, now, you want me, basically we're talking about coming out of addiction, what's the point? Why, why can't I just carry on? Especially if someone's really rich and they're addicted to drugs, why should they bother coming out of addiction? What's the problem? Right, and so he says, money is not the only thing which is stolen us from, from us by being addictive. Money is not the only thing which is stolen us by addictive disease. Cer certainly, it will steal our property, but, with, but it will also steal, listen to this, but it will also steal tan less tangible but more important things. It will steal our self-respect. Any form of addiction will steal your self-respect. It will. It will steal your innocence. It will steal your trustworthiness to others. It will steal your friendships. It will steal your relationships. It will steal your marriages. It will steal your jobs. It will steal your time. It will steal your accomplishments. It will steal your true identities. It will steal your ultimate freedom. Think about any form of addiction and you will see that these are true things. Your marriages. There was one man, another in one of the lectures that one, one of the brothers were giving, this, uh, this Australian sheikh was giving. This man, he was married and he had three girls. He had, he had a few children and he used to work for 40 years in a movie store and he had access to all forms of movies. And he was in this activity, this haram thing, for 40 years and he had a full family. And eventually one day he got caught by his daughter in the act and he lost his family, he couldn't see them for three years. This is an example of how family is stolen by addictions, all forms of addictions. You think your family is going to be patient with you for years and years if you're addicted to heroin or cocaine. No, you will see yourself on the streets like you see those individuals now, just not too far away from here. And so we find that to leave addictions is a must, it's, it's not a joke. If you're addicted to something, there, there are reasons, there are profound reasons for you to leave these kind of addictions. And now we come to how, what are these 12 steps? You can take a note or you can listen to the lecture afterwards, or you can just buy this book. It's really, really good. Um, it's got, it covers the thing from a different, a few different aspects. Number one to, for the 12 step program to leave addictions is that we admit that we are powerless. We admit that we are powerless to this disease. We know that we have completely given ourselves in. We admit that we were powerless over our condition and that our lives had become unmanageable. We Number two, we came to believe that a greater power than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So straight away, after realizing your sin, you turn to Allah. Or you turn to a greater power, which is Allah for us. We made a decision to turn over our will and our lives to the care of God as we understood Him. We made a decision, I'll rephrase that with Islamic terms. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That my will and my decisions are now administered and directed by the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First, I admit to my sin. Number two, I say Allah ma'ad Allah, you need to help me. Thirdly, I need to now behave in a way that Allah has dictated. Number four, we become 
we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We became fearless and we became people that were serious about the thing that we want to do. We became relentless in our mission. We were not willing to even for a second, okay, go back into the sin that we were in. We had, number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves and to other human beings, the exact nature of our wrongs. One of the things that, that experts always suggest for addictions is that you admit your addiction to a person trustworthy. Okay, to admit and to sort of, this is called finding yourself a sponsor in, 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 uh, in, uh, in sort of recovery terms. And so to, uh, to confess your sins, uh, to confess your sins to one person so that you can talk it through, so that they can be your sponsor, your support, your someone to listen to, someone that can supervise you, in other terms, finding yourself a sheikh. Or how the Qudama used to say, of the Tezkiah people, they used to say finding yourself Obviously, Shaykh is an Arabic word, but the issue is that if it was used in the correct way, finding yourself a muallim, a teacher, right? And so to find yourself someone who will be willing to listen to you. Okay, moving on. Number six, we were ready, we were entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects from our character, meaning we were now willing to give them up. We humbly, number seven, we humbly ask God to remove all of our shortcomings. We don't istighfar. We done proper istighfar. Okay, now number eight, moving on. We made a list of all of the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends with them all. Number nine, this is very important. We made direct amends to such people wherever possible. Meaning after doing istighfar to Allah, if this was haqqullah azza wa jal, that if your addiction made you destroy one of the rules of Allah's religion, which was strictly a right of Allah, then you do istighfar. But now if you find that the right that you have destroyed is a right of a human being, you've stole, you have stolen from somebody, you have insulted somebody, you need to also seek their forgiveness. This is what they're saying effectively. And alongside with that, this is very important. This is a very, very important advice for those for example thinking or even want to advise somebody else who's in this, who's addicted to something is that you need to a person need to make a, li a list of all of the triggers all of the things that trigger your addiction suppose you're addicted to tobacco the eating one and you want to leave it what triggers it if you're being around people after they finish their rice in the same table when the pan comes then maybe you need to leave if you are, for example, on your way to home, you are addicted to alcohol and you see an alcohol store, find another route. If you are someone who cannot control their gaze, one thing leads to the other and you end up in a certain website, then what triggers it? Maybe it's just seeing the news. Maybe it's just reading the metro. It could be, anything could be a trigger. And so to make a list of all of the triggers and to make an acute and a proper plan to avoid all of these triggers. You know yourself all the things that trigger you. It's not necessarily that the trigger itself is haram. This is important. So the trigger may not be haram. You might be watching, you might be, for example, listening to an Islamic talk by a muhajjaba sister, a sister covering herself nicely. Or even a niqab, a sister walking down the road, you might be thinking, this is fine. So it's not exactly always the case that that thing you're trying to avoid, okay, your trigger is, is the effect it has on you. So because of the trigger, the effect it has on you, that's why it's wrong. And so the triggers have to be listed and they need to be avoided. That's another thing. Another thing we need to remember, we need to remember all the time is that you will, when on your mission to leave addiction, you will always find relapses. Moments when you fall back. This is expected. But when you fall back, the next step is very, very important. When you fall back, number 10, we continued to take the personal invent inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted to it. When we made the mistake, I was clean for two months. All of a sudden, I fell into the sin again. I shouldn't become homeless, hopeless. You might become homeless, but you shouldn't become hopeless. You shouldn't become hopeless because Allah says, Inna Allah number one. And number two, I finished. Sorry, I finished, I'm just gonna finish it now, of course. So, admit to it and carry on, carry on. And then it says, uh, number 11, it says, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. So building your taqwa, building your connection with Allah will help you, you to avoid your addiction. And number 12 is carry this message to others. This is really important because I thought for a long time, like this is an impression people have, like how am I going to tell someone else to pray and I don't even pray myself five times a day, right? It's a common 
problem that you find yourself in. How am I going to advise somebody else to be a good Muslim when I'm half half myself? But what we don't realize, and even according to these systems, is that by inviting others, it encourages and strengthens you. So da'wah, ADP, will help you to become a better Muslim yourself. Does that make sense? That while you are in the mission of helping others, you are going to help yourself. It's like when you teach, you might not know the subject properly, but once you are teaching, now I, I, I never knew much about addictions, but when I had to teach this to topic, I became a lot more knowledgeable about this topic. And so, like that, when you help others, this helps you. There are, there's so much more to be said, but I hope some benefit has come from this lecture, inshallah. And obviously, I'm sure we'll have questions and answers. Firzakumullah khairan wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Uh, we've got just like uh, we're short in time, so we've got just a bit for Q and A. So if you have any questions or quick comments or something that you want the chef to clarify um, that he's he's made, um, now's the time. So I'll open up for uh, for the floor for any questions and comments. So anyone? No. Right, so maybe I can ask a question, um, just a quick question. Is it a real question or? Because <laughs> if you don't have a question, I just wanted to add something in. But you can ask a question if it's an actual it's question. It's something related to the youth. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So there's, there's quite a few youths youth here. And a lot of the, uh, there's a problem that they face, especially when they're young, growing up, they're yeah. exposed to drugs and smoking. Yeah. And usually, when you try and walk away, yeah. they, they look down at you, they laugh at you. So what advice would you give to them in a situation where they are in, in that situation? Yeah. I understand the question. It's because it's we, we can't imagine it sometimes because we're like, for example, you probably were brought up in an Islamic neighborhood and you had a good family, big family, and you can't imagine you've got enough brothers to chill with and sisters to chill with, let alone going outside to try and find basketball friends, right? So this is probably unimaginable to some people. But for a lot of people, their sense of you know, social experience or socializing with, with people that they don't know, or even at school. And so this takes a lot of courage. I've got to say that the first and foremost advice parents long time ago should have done for, 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 for kids and to make sure that your kids or our kids or our young people you are getting involved with the right kind of people, right friends okay so your friends might look down upon you this is a sacrifice you're gonna have to take okay to find yourself good friends is the first step because you know the ayah says in the Quran you know on the day of judgment, someone will regret, and وَيَوْمَ يَعَدُّ الظَّالِمُ is like a, is a, is a, is a term which refers to uh, regret, an extreme level of regret, that he will bite his fingers out of regret. <sighs> like that, right? That he's going to say, I wish I took Allah as a friend, and I wish I never had that guy as a friend, because he destroyed me. And in, for example, Surah Al-Safat, we find those people that they are, they are shown, those people that are in Jahannam, and they were their friends, they said, oh, because I was about to go to Jahannam because of you. And so to literally walk away to find the right kind of friends, this is the first step. And it's really, really important as parents, as guardians, to make sure your kids are chilling with the right kind of people. Because one thing I learned from a friend, once we were doing this TV show in, on Al Huda TV in Egypt, and we had a, had a, a speaking with this other sheikh, and he was like talking to him about um, Tarbiyah, and he said, my dad was such a clever guy. One day what he did for to check out my friends his dad is checking out his friends he's so clever he goes to him oh, son I love you so much and uh, you know you're, you're very beloved to me I want to invite all of your friends to a house for dinner do you see what he's doing so they all came over for dinner and one by one what's your who are you what do you do where's your what's your dad who's your dad what's your what do you do okay right okay how okay how do, you, how do you guys know each other and he knew his whole social circle today's age if you're a parent and your kids are on instagram you need to get one if they're on facebook you need to get one for proper purposes not just so that you can start you know thinking about what the bollywood shows are all about right so proper purposes so if you are these are kind of monitoring and the circles that we need to make sure that our kids in it takes proper work man it's not a joke having kids is not is not a joke it's not just about child benefit it's a proper proper responsibility you're going to go to jannah because of these kids they're going to make dua for you after you die you're going to be relaxing in jannah and they're going to be praying for you you want that reward that residual income you need to work for it so may allah give us all the tawfiq inshallah <coughs> Uh, I think we will uh, conclude. Uh, before we do finish, just a reminder that we do hold this uh, event once a month, the first Sunday of the month.
So please do keep that in your diaries. There's a, a board going around. Please do write your email, your name, um, and a reminder will inshallah be sh uh, sent to you. Uh, I think, mashallah, the, the lecture was very beneficial, wonderful, alhamdulillah, we all benefited. Um, I understand, like, you know, he did a lot of hard working, actually. I requested him to prepare this topic, and alhamdulillah, he done very well. May Allah bless him and reward him. Uh, we are very, actually, privileged to uh, have a few uh, special people in our event today. Uh, it's not the quantity, but it's the quality. So, alhamdulillah, we are blessed with... Uh, um, uh, uh, our respected Sheikh Malana Abdul Karim, he is the ex uh, um, chairman of uh, Teachers of Islamic Association in Tahamlets. Also, our brother uh, Councillor Mahbub Alam from Stepney. Also, my brother uh, Shanur Mia, the, the teacher of um, uh, St. Paul's Way School. Am I right, Brother Shanur Mia? Yes. So, Alhamdulillah, so we've got a few uh, very important uh, people. We're very happy to see you here. Please uh, uh, do support us with your du'as in whatever mean you can. Uh, it's a struggle, it's a platform that we want to engage our youth uh, in righteous and in, in good things. So please do uh, support us as much as you can. Your your presence is, is, is a form of encouragement and motivation. Uh, inshallah, um, uh, there will be refreshments available if you can make your way after the dua. And dua will be made by the speaker, Sheikh Kazi. No, no. Thank you very much once again from Al Falak Dao Project and from Collingwood Masjid. Uh, shukran Jazeera. Mama, Mama, please. Mama, please. Please, Ayuko. So, my respected Mama, she will be making the dua. But I just wanted to add one more thing which is so important. I can't, I can't miss this. And I've, I learned this from one of the, uh, a really, really, like, uh, mashallah, very knowledgeable Sheikh um, in one of our visits to Egypt. And he said this is it's so, so, so important and it's so effective. He says that generally, if your sin is one of privacy, which is involved in privacy, so anything, drugs, whatever, alcohol, any form of sin that's to do with privacy, the cure for that is similar to the kind of the crime. What does that mean? It means if your sin is in privacy, then for you to be able to gain power over yourself in that private moment, you need to cure that problem by worshipping Allah in privacy. Tahajjud, 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 it's winter season, you don't have an excuse. Tahajjud, if you can do it properly, having a proper connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will literally have, inshallah, bi Allah azza wa jal, this light of immunity around you if you are sincere to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worshipping Allah in Tahajjud, Quran, Salah, these are things literally antidotes or you can call them antiviruses against all forms of sins addiction influences okay especially worshiping Allah in secrecy I've also got when you have that surge or urge one of the things when you feel like doing something bad you should remember Allah and instantaneously do this you've got an urge you don't know how to control it or someone's got an urge you don't know how to control it or straight away change direction like I said before effective even more take a shower Clean yourself completely, not like a chilling shower, shower to cleanse yourself. Wear the clothes of your honor. The person that you stand in society, wear those clothes. That will remind you who you are. Wear religious fragrances, wear oud, wear masks. It will remind you that aroma will make you feel like you're amongst other good companions uh, in the masjid. And of course, last but not least, being around good people, right? Ultimately, to run from whatever it is that you're addicted to in all of the possible ways and ultimately seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability. I'll ask for the Shaykh Al Hafiz Mawlana Abdul Karim, Hafizahullah, to make the dua, inshaAllah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Innaka hamidun majid. اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين 
نبينا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه واهل بيته اجمعين ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار وادخلنا الجنه مع الابرار برحمتك يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب اللهم طهر قلوبنا من النفاق وعملي من الرياء ولساني من الكذب والعين من الخيانه والعين من الخيانه والعين من الخيانه فانك تعلم خائنه الاعين وما تخفي الصدور اللهم حبب الينا الايمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره الينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان واجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم اذهب الباس رب الناس اشف انت الشافي لا شفاء الا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر سقما اللهم اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا واكرمنا ولا تهمنا واعطنا ولا تحرمنا واثرنا ولا تؤثر علينا واردنا وارض عنا اللهم انا نسالك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم انا نسالك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم انا نسالك العفو والعافيه والمعافاه الدائمه في الدين والدنيا والآخرة ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولأستاذنا ولشيخنا ولمشايخنا ولأحبابنا ولأزواجنا ولذرياتنا ولمن له حق علينا ولجميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم يسر علينا زيارة حرمك وحرم نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل أن تميتنا يا الله ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم يسر حسابنا ويمن كتابنا وثبت على السرات قدامنا واجعل آخر كلامنا من الدنيا شهادة لا إله إلا الله أن محمد عبده ورسوله وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه ونور عرشه محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين آمين السلام عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته